Um, so if we look at methane, methane is a molecular compound. Compound is two or more elements chemically combined like this. So we have hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen's the white ones, carbon's, excuse me, um, carbon's the black one. Um, this is how it's arranged, the con connectivity there, the connections. And so we got methane. Methane is a molecular compound, it's a gas. We can burn it. When we burn it, we take oxygen and air to burn it. When you burn methane, what do you form? So this is just showing that methane is reacting with or combining with oxygen to form hopefully not much carbon monoxide. If this is burning nicely, there should be very little carbon monoxide forming. Instead, we should form carbon dioxide, CO2. Um, carbon dioxide is one carbon, two oxygens. It's also a molecular compound, it's a gas, and water. H2O liquid. Now, um, this is a, an example of a chemical change or chemical process because what happens is, you know, and then this is where atomic theory came about because atomic theory says, you know, the atoms are neither uh, created nor destroyed kind of thing. Um, that is, uh, the conservation of, of mass or the conservation of matter meant that, you know, all the atoms that you started with, you have to end with. Otherwise, there would be a change in mass because the atoms weigh different amounts. And so, if we start off with one carbon, we end up with one carbon. But the way they explain this is that the atoms get rearranged in a chemical process like this. And so here, the carbon, which was once bonded to hydrogen, is now bonded to oxygen. And the oxygen, which was once just bonded to oxygen, is now bonded to both carbon and hydrogen. And so this is an example of chemical change where uh, the substances have changed. All the atoms are still there, uh, but the substances have changed. And so one thing when we look at this here, um, when we look at this here, uh, we got one carbon atom here. We have one carbon atom here, so the carbon ended up here. And then we have four hydrogen atoms here. But look at, I only have two hydrogen atoms here, so two hydrogen atoms disappeared. Well, it can't. We've got conservation of mass, conservation of matter. And so what I need to do is I need four hydrogens here. So should I do this? I, I know an easy way. I'm just going to make uh, water with four hydrogens, H4O. And then that takes care of it. Now I have my four hydrogens. I start off with four hydrogens. I end up with four hydrogens. Can I do that? No. No, because this is no longer water. And so I have to think of some other way to do that. I can't just go ahead and change the, these are called subscripts here. These subscripts I can't change because it tells me the ratio. These, these, re, these ratios are fixed. These are compounds, substances. And so the only way I can do that is by having two waters formed. If I have two water molecules formed, then that gives me a total of four hydrogen. But it also doubles the amount of oxygen. Am I okay with that? Well, not really, because now I got two oxygens over here, but now I got a total of four oxygens over here, so should I just do this? I'll just go with an O4. You know, I already know O, O2, O3. I just add an O4 to this, so that you can do it. Should I? Now, O4, I don't even know what that is. It doesn't it really exist. And instead, I should do this. I need to change what's called the coefficients. And so two, this is one. These are called the coefficients. And so we can change the coefficients without changing the identity of this stuff. So we just vary, vary the coefficients in order to make sure. Now all the atoms are there. I started off with one carbon, I end up with one carbon. I started with four hydrogens, I end up with four hydrogens. Now they're in water. I, end up with, I started with four oxygens because I had two um, oxygens in the diatomic molecule, and I got two of those diatomic molecules. And then I end up with four oxygens. Does everybody see that? The count there? 
And so this is the conservation of mass or conservation of matter. And this is why the hypothesis uh, came about for the existence of atoms, because we just rearrange the atoms. Okay? Whereas if matter were infinitely divisible, then um, maybe it's not so cleanly. OK, now, um, now here we just say the total mass here <coughs> is equal to the total mass here. And um, pretty much this is what's observed. You know? and this is why it became a law, because each time they tested this, each time they looked, uh, it was a consistent pattern. Until more recently. And so this works very well. You can't measure the difference in mass. And we still can't measure the difference in mass. It's only when we get to a certain type of reaction we can measure the difference in mass. And that has to do with one other thing that's produced in this. You know, why burn methane? You know, what's one of the main reasons for burning methane? It's cheap. It's cheap, I guess. It's available. What do you use it for? What do you use burning methane for? As energy, isn't it? As energy, right. And so you heat things up with it. And so um, it wasn't until this. So we have this, this is called a balanced chemical equation. And this would be a chemical reaction here. One of the chemical properties of methane is it reacts with oxygen in this way. And this forms um, water liquid. OK, we, we burn methane for energy. And it wasn't until um, like the, until the nuclear, you know, the amount of energy you get out of this, is it like a nuclear bomb's worth of energy? No. But what they notice is this. What they notice is when they have a nuclear bomb's worth of energy, then the mass indeed did change. And that is, it's because of this. The amount of energy that you get is dictated by this equation, equals mc squared. You heard of that equation? Or delta E equals delta mc squared. Now, what delta, what is delta? The change. And so this is the change in energy. The change in energy is going to be related to delta M. What is M? M is mass. And so the amount of energy that you get is going to come from conversion of mass into energy, or vice versa. C, do you know what C is? Speed of light, speed of light and which is a constant in the vacuum. So speed of light. And so um, basically what they figured is this. The energy comes from a conversion of mass into energy. Now for chemical reactions, you can't measure it. It's such a small, negligible amount of mass that's lost in this reaction that there's no way to measure that you know, um, easily. However, if you have a, a nuclear reaction, like a nuclear bomb, there's such a huge amount of energy that's released in a nuclear explosion that you can actually measure the mass differences or calculate it, whatever. And so technically, um, we should modify it. You know, back in the 1700s all the way to now, we had the law of conservation of mass. And so your book ends with this. And then in chapter two, your book ends with the conservation of mass and energy. And then we're technically correct. The conservation of mass and energy means that the total mass and energy at the beginning, so we, we say mass and energy at the beginning, is equal to the total mass and energy at the end. And so this would be the conservation of mass and energy. Are we going to do anything with it? Not really. You know, uh, if we do some more nuclear chem, we could. Um, it's pretty easy, the calculations, but we just have to be aware that, you know, we just had to modify it a little bit, but, you know, the, the difference in mass is so small in chemical reactions that we aren't even going to measure it. And so the conservation of mass, um, people still use today, you know, reliably. Now,
Okay. Um, now, if we have a mixture like this, well, one, of, one of the ways is, okay, we measure the properties. Oh, this is a mixture. You know, the boiling point's not exactly at 100. There's some stuff in here. Well, we've got to figure out what that stuff is. Can you tell me? If I gave this to you, can you tell me what's in it? I want to know what's in it. You know, component A, what percent, or parts per million, or parts per billion. Component B, each component would be a substance, like an element or a compound. And so, um, you know, one of the things, like, for example, electrical conductivity can't tell you. Electric, does oxygen conduct electricity? No, uh, not really, unless the voltage is very high, like a lightning bolt. It won't conduct electricity. And so, e even if you put your uh, probes in here to measure the electrical resistance, this still can be contaminated with oxygen. Well, oxygen, do you worry about contamination by oxygen? If you did, you know how to get rid of the oxygen? How you get rid of the oxygen is easy. You put this on the stove and you start heating it. Do you know if you heat this to below boiling, like the temperature is way below the boiling point, bubbles start to form. Those bubbles, you know what those bubbles are? Those bubbles are oxygen and nitrogen. Those bubbles are dissolved air. There's a little bit of air that gets dissolved in the water. So one way we could do this is we can separate out the dissolved air from the water just by heating it up. The fish aren't gonna like it, but at least you're gonna have ultra pure water. Do you want ultra pure water free of oxygen and nitrogen? Or do you even care? Uh, I probably didn't care, but some people would care. I, I had to care, I had to care about oxygen. If there's dissolved oxygen, that would have screwed up my experiment. I couldn't have any oxygen in the water. You know? Otherwise, hmm? I, I never tasted it. I don't know. What's that? Like, you went through all the effort to make sure that you didn't even taste some water. I should have tasted the water. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> no, I, never, I never saw the point of tasting it because the. Uh, the difference. Yeah, yeah I, I tasted distilled water, but not doubly distilled and not coming out of the still. Because if you saw our still, you wouldn't want to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. I, I, although I, yeah, I'm sure it's very pure, but just you know, just there's something about it that just really <laughs> doesn't seem so appealing. You know, you got to decorate it with some kind of like beer type stuff or something like that. But anyway, um, but I did. I did. You know what I tasted in the chemistry lab? I, I well, I fermented uh, alcohol, and so I tasted ethanol, 95% ethanol. And so that was. That was a good experience. <laughs> Although the, the problem is, is I expected a taste, but you know, when you um, if you put 95% ethanol in your mouth, it evaporates so fast that you don't really taste anything. You know, you kind of smell it, and, and so it was it was okay. <laughs> but uh, that and uh, I, uh, that's about it. I think the stuff I tasted. But I, I've tasted this. This is called deionized water. It's not before, but I, I shouldn't because there's stuff that can get in there into the deionized. And distilled is um, distilled is good. But uh, let's continue on here. Um, what was I going to say about? Yeah. So what we want to do is, is we we want to figure out what's in that water. So there are different ways we could do it. Um, and, and if we have a mixture like this, all mixtures can be separated into their components by physical separation techniques. And so if we look at um, physical separation, just do a quick search for that. I had it up, but I have so many things up right now. Physical separation techniques, um, there are a lot. And so what I did for the alcohol, I had a mixture of you know, ferment, yeast, a whole bunch of other stuff in there, yeast, sugar, fermentation products. And so what I did was I just took that soup and then just um, distilled it. When I distilled it, what happens is ethanol vaporizes as a lower boiling point than everything else. And so what happens is the ethanol boils off and goes to the gaseous state. Then you have what's called a condensation tube. You run cold water through a jacket here, and uh, that cold water will condense the ethanol back into a liquid, and then you have your ethanol here. 
problem with distilling alcohols is it's sometimes it's hard to get rid of all the water. You know, a little bit of water gets carried over. Well, azeotropes. Other things are very clean as far as distillation goes. It's very clean. You can distill a lot of things. You know, liquids, it makes sense. You can distill liquids pretty easily. Easily. Um, here, you could distill like crude oil, you know, at the refineries. They'll distill crude oil. Crude oil is a mixture of a whole bunch of things. And they have these columns. The longer the column here, the more um, separation you get. And that is, um, let's see, how much time? Um, and uh, you, you, you can separate it into um, its very various components. Uh, so one of the companies that, uh, that, that are around, have you ever heard of liquid air? Liquid air you can buy, like if you want to buy some pure nitrogen, you can get some nitrogen from them or pure oxygen or mixtures. You know what they do? They take the air and then they liquefy it you know, by um, increasing pressure, and decreasing the temperature. They liquefy it and then they distill it. When they distill the air, they can separate the nitrogen from the oxygen because um, the, the nitrogen boils off first, and then they can capture that, and then the oxygen boils off later. And so it's, an, it's a way to separate nitrogen from oxygen. It turns out it's a very expensive way. And so this is, this is why people are looking for cheaper ways. My friend uh, worked at Liquid Air, and still works there, I think. And so one of the projects he was working on is figuring out a cheaper way to separate nitrogen from oxygen. So did I talk about the molecular sieves? Yes. Is it a little bit? Yeah, it's like a filter, yeah. And so the, uh, those people who are carrying around oxygen cylinders, you know, the, those usually oxygen is produced in a traditional way, you know, by this distillation kind of thing. But um, now they're getting rid of the cylinder and carrying around a little pump, an air pump. And the air pump passes the air through a little filter and the, it filters out the nitrogen and lets the oxygen pass. It's not 100% efficient. So the air that goes through is enriched in oxygen and so they can breathe that for decreased lung capacity. And so uh, you can distill lots of different things. There are other techniques too, like filtration. Let's see, I'll show you. Uh, yeah, I think most people are familiar with filtration, right? Uh, let's, see. let's see. This is your typical filtration apparatus here. This is filter paper. The molecular sieve idea is just the exact same idea. You can buy lots of different grades of filter paper. The filter paper can have tiny pores. Filter paper can have big pores. And depending on that, you know, the, the tiny pore filter paper filters very slowly. So a lot of people don't like it because it takes so long to filter things. So they, they sacrifice. Um, there's other techniques as well. Uh, one of the techniques is this. One of the techniques is, um, you know, if you have a mixture here, you put it, what's called a solvent, like alcohol in here, and the alcohol will creep up the paper. And so this is, this is, looks like ink. And so ink, they get different colors by mixing different colors of inks. And so what they do is they just let the alcohol slowly creep up the paper. As it creeps up, you know, the more soluble components of the ink will flow along, and the less soluble will be left behind. And so the longer this column is, the more separation you get. And so one way of thinking about this is, is like if you have a jogging race. If you have a jogging race, you know, everybody's bunched up at the start. But the longer that is, the more separation there's going to be. And you get a clean separation as we go along um, through this. this. This door is actually, you can unlock, but it gets jammed. So. All right, so uh, this is called liquid chromatography here. And liquid chromatography is used to separate a lot of things. We also have uh, gas chromatography. Uh, yeah, that door requires a lot of force to pull open. And so in gas chromatography, they heat things up to get them in the gaseous space. So that's why you see this big oven. And then you see this coil here? They have these long coils where they just let it flow um, through here and then separate things out. So this is called gas chromatography. Um, 
here. And these are called columns. And so you inject your sample here, and then it runs with the gas, this is carrier gas, and some things run at the same speed, some things run slowly, depending on the property. And so if this column's long enough, you can separate everything out cleanly. And so there are different ways we could separate. So we could do the same thing with this water sample. We could separate it into different components using physical means. Uh, um, that, that, should be, that should be good. And so um, by doing that, then we can analyze it. But there are certain things that are very difficult to separate. Let's see, how late do we go? Till 4.30. Till 4.30? Okay. You know, um, there are very complicated mixtures that are extremely difficult. Separation is not so easy. You know, if you think about, you know, how many different components are in here, there could be a lot, and it could be very difficult to separate, especially if you have tiny, tiny, minute part per billion, part per trillion quantities of these things. It could be very difficult to, to um, capture that. And so uh, sometimes people give up. Um, sometimes they, they think of other ways. Rather than separating it, just leave it together and then um, inject, you know. So what they'll do is they'll inject a reference sample and if the reference sample runs at the same speed as whatever they're looking at, then they go, oh, that must be this, right? And so what they have, like, uh, there's, a, there's a classic story at the University of Michigan. Um, they were uh, testing um, electric fields. That is, they, they got one platinum wire, another platinum wire, and the power supply. The power supply pushed all the negative charge on the one side and left the other side positively charged. So you got a positive and negative wire. That positive and negative wire creates a voltage which creates what's called an electric field. So what they're looking at is they're looking at do electric fields interfere with the growth of tumor cells? And so this is why they stuck the wires in there. And so they, they cranked up the voltage and, and then watched. But what, what happened was something very unusual. The wires started reacting with the tumor cells and it, it produced something. It, it, there was a chemical change. It produced some kind of product. We call these products. The products. These would be the reactants. So produce some kind of products. They didn't know what the products were, but whatever the products were of that reaction, it was a chemical reaction, killed all the tumor cells. Yeah, it was very effective. And so they wanted to know what the products of that reaction were. But, you know, can you imagine how many components are there in a tumor cell, and then you got these additional components? Are you going to separate everything out and list everything, excuse me, as a percentage? Percentage this person? No, it's too much. And so what they did was they grabbed a book like the CRC, or they looked in, actually, they didn't grab the CRC, they looked at more advanced, more comprehensive ones on platinum chemistry. They, they grabbed a book on platinum chemistry and they figured out, okay, there's platinum there, what other elements are there? There's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, et cetera, sulfur. And so they looked at all the possible combinations of chemicals, and then they, they um, went to a catalog and bought every single compound with that combination of atoms, elements in there. And then they tested each of those and you know they got lucky because they found out what it is, what it was. And it, um, it, was, it was a compound called cisplatin. And cisplatinum, that's how it was discovered. They just bought a whole bunch of bottles off the shelf. and tested. These were biologists, not chemists. Chemists probably would have thought, oh, how am I gonna synthesize it? You know, how am I gonna make it? Um, but they bought it off the shelf and they figured out this must be it, and it was. And uh, it turned into one of the biggest anti-cancer uh, drugs of, of the time. This was in the 1970s and brought in millions and millions of dollars to that particular lab, if not close to a billion by now. It's still in use today, that, that particular drug. Um, anyway, uh, that's an interesting story. You could read about it on Wikipedia. You know, but, uh, then, uh, let's see, do we have... One more thing. And so we can separate it into components, but one thing um, is this. You know, once we get to substances, like for example, like gold, can we, can we break gold down and separate it further? No. Yes. What about water? Water, we could potentially break that down further. For example, for water, we could break that down into hydrogen and oxygen. You know, how do we do that? We do that not by physical means, we'd have to do it by chemical means. And the chemical means is we add energy, but we add energy in a special way. We add energy via something called electrolysis, which is, which I'll show you. Um, 
a second. We add energy by electrolysis, and then we can break that. Or we add a huge amount of kinetic energy, and we can break it into atomic. But when we do electrolysis, it breaks up into hydrogen and oxygen. Now we have to balance this. If we take liquid water, we need two waters. We'll form two hydrogens and one oxygen. And the hydrogen and oxygen are both going to be gases. And so let's um, end this with just a quick uh, YouTube um, electrolysis here. Uh, and this is going to be by chemical means. So uh, let's look at electrolysis of water, which I have, but i got to find it up here. Okay, this is a, like a homemade electrolysis apparatus here. You probably can do it with a 9-volt battery uh, work. But th these guys, this guy uses a 12-volt power supply. And then I'm just going to cycle through it. So he designed some stuff to capture the gases. We have an electrolysis apparatus, too. But these bottles he's using to capture the gases. And then rather than using platinum, he's using um, stainless steel. Stainless steel is pretty corrosion resistant, but not nearly as corrosion resistant as platinum. Is. And then he's going to hook up an electrical power supply to generate positive and negative charge on those. And if he generates a big enough positive and negative charge, that is 12 volts, actually 9 volts. Oh, you need, how many volts do you need for this? You need about 3 volts for this. And so double A is probably not enough, unless you put them in series. So like 9 volts. So he put some water in there. And then um, he has these bottles that he can collect the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas that are going to be produced at those. Uh, this is called an ammeter. Then he hooks up the uh, electric leads and, and uh, cranks up the voltage. And then um, basically you can see some gas being generated there. There's the oxygen gas being generated there at that electrode or that wire, or that plate and then hydrogen at the other one. And so you can see that, uh, here, let me speed this up here. So he's collecting these in these plastic bags. Yeah, it turns out one gas is, this is 2.8 amps, I guess. This is one hour, okay, let's see. Yeah, uh, it turns out that one gas is going to produce, be produced at one, and another gas. You can tell which gas is which. Yeah, because we produce twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. So this must be hydrogen, this must be oxygen here. And it's going to be produced, uh, hydrogen is going to be produced at the, um, at the uh, negative wire or plate. Um, oxygen is going to be produced at the positive wire or plate. It's just because of the way it is. All right. And so um, then let's uh, watch him launch the uh, balloon here. And then that's it. Well, that's uh, that's separation of hydrogen from oxygen um, in a compound.